OK, where are we now? If I were to ask that question to everybody in this room, where are we now? You'd probably all give different answers. So you might say we're in the British Library. You might say we're in row H. You might say we're in the city that hosted the Olympics. You might say we're in the Northern Hemisphere. The point is, you might all give a different answer. And in reality, the reason that we usually ask that question, where are we now? If we arrive at King's Cross Station, for example, we go looking for one of those big maps. The reason is that we want to be somewhere else and we have to work out where we are in order to get there. We've heard plenty this morning about wanting to be somewhere else, reinventing the, the whole of our financial system, uh, the, the market system that we're, we're so used to, um, but also, as well as having uh, a sense of where, where we want to be, there needs to be a context. So if after this conference you go out onto the street outside the British Library and a foreign tourist comes and asks you, uh, where are we now? You probably wouldn't give them a set of GIS coordinates because they wouldn't understand what you were saying. Although with so many scientists in the room, I can't absolutely be certain that you wouldn't give GIS coordinates. So there does need to be a context as, as well as a purpose when we ask that, that question, where are we now? Um, in the next 15 minutes or so, I'm going to take you on a, a short journey from where we are now to perhaps a very slightly different perspective for each of you on where we are now. And to do that, I'm just going to ask a few questions that I'd like you to answer mentally to yourselves. So first of all, are you a consumer? Are you a voter? Are you perhaps a parent? Are you a scientist? Are you a business person? Do you have friends who are business people? The point is, there are so many different things that define our identity. What I'd like you to do over the next few minutes as I go through these slides is to just make a mental decision to shift your perspective that little bit and see this from a perspective that you don't normally use to look at the, the whole topic of, of natural capital and our life support systems. And incidentally, I do know it's possible to change your perspective because I couldn't fail to notice over lunchtime the tone in somebody's voice of astonishment when I heard a comment, say, somebody saying, um, wasn't that accountant inspiring? <laughs> so it's possible to change our perspective. But one thing is for certain in terms of where we are now, and in the same way as we can be confident that we are all sitting in the auditorium of the Conference Centre at the British Library in London, we can be equally confident that we are at a critical juncture in terms of protecting and restoring our natural capital. We've heard the recent WWF report that says that since 1970, which is the year I was born, we've lost more than half of our vertebrate species. We've heard the IPCC report. Even Ban Ki-moon is urging companies to divert, divest from fossil fuels. By 2050, projections are that global temperature change alone, global temperature increase alone, will lead to a 20% reduction in the yield of all major grains. So there are huge implications for natural capital here. Huge threats to natural capital, but huge implications for how good stewardship of our natural capital can help, at least to address some of these problems. Peter said this morning, our natural capital debt is 10 times our financial debt. Richard said this morning, every year nature faces a $7 trillion crisis. So to answer Giles's question about whether we're overstating this, well, natural capital might not be the answer to everything, but it does genuinely underpin everything, which I think is the point of this conference today, our life support systems. So I'm going to answer the question, where are we now, in three different ways. First of all, I'll look at uh, what's happened since the first World Forum on Natural Capital, which Alison kindly mentioned just now, that took place last year. Secondly, I'll take a look at what's happening in Scotland. I'm based in Edinburgh, um, and there's an initiative that we launched last year, which I can, I can tell you about. And finally, I'll just offer a couple of personal reflections on where I think we are now. But please remember, just try to take that slightly different perspective as you listen to these next few slides. So you've heard that the World Forum took place um, 
bringing together a, a very wide range of stakeholders from around the world. We had 35 countries represented um, at that event. It was organised by the Scottish Wildlife Trust, where I work in partnership with a range of international business and environmental organisations. The Natural Capital Coalition here today, the United Nations Environment Programme, the World Business Council for Sustainable Development uh, and IUCN, the International Union for Conservation of Nature. Um, also, the wider Wildlife Trust movement, the Scottish Wildlife Trust uh, is an NGO that is a member of the Wildlife Trust movement. This is really natural capital in action and the, the community-led nature of, of, the, of the Wildlife Trust is a very important addition to this debate and I would probably add to Alan Watts' slide this morning uh, talking about the importance of integrating science and policy. It's the importance of integrating science and policy and practice as well. So there were lots of themes debated at the event, as you might, uh, as you might imagine. Um, is regulation necessary, desirable? I think we would all agree uh, that it's necessary. But what do business leaders think? Um, how do we... Uh, how do we work out which numbers are the important ones? How do we identify the right tools for business, trade-offs, all those kinds of things. But as well as those uh, questions, a couple of other topics emerged. We've talked a lot this morning about not sharing a common language, so I won't dwell on that point, but it is an important one. But secondly, you'll see from this slide that we identified the, the challenge of natural capital being seen on the one hand by people in sustainability as just, well, more of the same, and by another uh, segment of, uh, of society and the NGO community as being essentially synonymous with biodiversity offsetting. Now, first of all, that's actually not true, but secondly, more importantly, it does raise some really big ethical questions. So when I step into a different pair of shoes, as I've just asked you to do. Uh, I'm going to look at the World Forum from the point of view of some protesters that were outside the World Forum last year. And those protesters were concerned about the monetization of nature and they were concerned about the risks of talking about capital. Now, what did those protesters see when they looked through the windows of the Edinburgh International Conference Centre? Did they think, oh, look at all those people changing the world? Or did they see people in suits earning lots of money who can add up, as Richard said this morning? Probably, if I'd been on the outside of the building looking in, I wouldn't have seen the diversity of the participants at the event from all around the world, from NGOs, from academia, from business from legislators, <coughs> government representatives, and so on. But they do raise some incredibly important points. Before I just move on to a very important development that's emerged uh, as a result of these discussions, uh, I would just show you this, this one thing that I think the protesters wouldn't have seen if I'd been amongst them looking in. I wouldn't have seen that there were some people who had never, ever engaged with this topic before who came to that event and who for the first time, like this young man Monde from South Africa, who was an absolutely inspirational speaker, who we contacted about six weeks before the event because we'd come across him online, and he said, I have this vision that young people can do so much to change the world. And he mentioned the environment in passing. Education was actually his big passion. But we contacted him because we thought that he could help bridge that gap between all of us talking to ourselves and reaching the non-usual suspects. And after the event, we had this lovely piece of feedback from Monde uh, saying that it's really completely changed his view of the importance of valuing nature. So maybe I wouldn't have seen that if I'd been on the outside of the building. For the next event uh, in November 2015, the... Uh, the three aims are relatively simple, progressing global action, uh, but within an ethical framework, which is what I'd like to talk to you about. Secondly, talking about how profound change can only happen through collaboration. I don't think I need to explain the importance of that to people in this room. And thirdly, about contributing to existing international targets. So the Natural Capital Charter, I can give you a sneak peek uh, of this initiative, which um, is not yet in the public domain. Um, but which a few of you uh, know about and have already contributed to, so thank you for that. Uh, the Natural Capital Charter is being developed as an ethical framework for the application of natural capital mechanisms. 
and it's going to ask some difficult questions uh, and tackle the risks. It's being led by IUCN, the International Union for the Conservation of Nature, and I'm sure all of you know IUCN. Uh, if you don't, it's the world's uh, oldest and largest uh, global conservation body, and its, its members are made up of uh, states and NGOs. Um, there will be a consultation on this next year, and this is really important because we would encourage everybody in the room to contribute to this. And the Natural Capital Charter will be launched at the next World Forum on Natural Capital, which again will be in Edinburgh in uh, November 2015, the 26th and 27th of November. Um, the consultation is also going to be facilitated by the Green Economy Coalition, so we really do urge you all to take part in that. And in terms of the questions that we'll, we'll be asking, there, there are very many, um, I won't go into any of the detail just now, but to give you a flavour of that, you know, how do we actually make this relevant within the context of planetary boundaries? How do we make sure that this doesn't work to the detriment of the intrinsic value of nature? What about transboundary issues? So impacts of activity in one place um, can obviously sometimes be felt in a completely different part of the world, which presents challenges uh, in, in measuring that impact. Uh, the rights of indigenous peoples, how do we make sure there's inclusive design of, of uh, natural capital methodologies? So, um, what about where we are now in Scotland? The World Forum last year was an opportunity to launch the Scottish Forum on Natural Capital. Um, and a fellow steering group member is sitting there in the front row, which is great, from the James Hutton Institute. What's interesting about the Scottish Forum on Natural Capital uh, is it brings together uh, a very wide range of stakeholders. Earlier on, a questioner was asking about um, landowners and so on. On the steering group, we've got an ex-president of the National Farmers Union in Scotland, uh, but we've also got business representation from Alliance Trust, one of your sponsors here today. Uh, we've got the Scottish Government's chief economist, uh, we've got NGO representation, the Scottish Wildlife Trust, uh, RSPB, the Woodland Trust. Uh, but we've also got um, a large and growing membership. You can see here the founding partners um, of Scot the Scottish Forum on Natural Capital are the Scottish Wildlife Trust with four other organisations. Um, Scotland's 2020 Clim Climate Group, very important, um, broad uh, coalition of, of stakeholders uh, dealing with uh, <coughs> climate change and, and carbon related issues. The University of Edinburgh, ICAS, which is the Institute of Chartered Accountants in Scotland, and the Institute of Directors in Scotland. Um, you can see the, not even all of the members are shown on that, that slide. Very quickly, uh, we found we had almost more members than we um, could deal with, so that was great. We didn't have to go out and look for them, they more or less came to us. Um, which has given us a real opportunity to make sure we get the right people in the room um, and trying to solve these problems together. And as you're thinking about this, if you're taking that different perspective that I suggested you might want to do at the beginning, I think one of the key things that we've discovered uh, is that having more people around the table with different perspectives and different expertise um, is essential in terms of defining the, the real life solutions. Uh, we do have a vision uh, which is, is relatively simple. The first one is about understanding how we impact on natural capital and how we rely on it. The second one is about that understanding leading to action. And the third one is about leadership beyond Scotland's borders. When the First Minister spoke at the World Forum last year, he really took this on board and then started championing it in, in other um, context and we've seen that it's had a galvanizing effect for people within Scotland bringing um, an international audience um, to bear on this debate. So what does the Scottish business community think about natural capital? Um, where are we now in, in that respect? And we ran a survey uh, which we, we launched the results last week actually. Um, this survey ran online over the space of a month and we worked with the Institute of Directors um, in Scotland and ICAS. You'll see that in terms of size of company, uh, the one on the left represents small businesses, the one on the right, large businesses. Uh, so there was a broad spread. Interestingly, the ones in the middle were less represented, but this was, uh, we had over 500 business leaders respond. Uh, this is the spread of sectors. So we had an equally broad spread of sectors, everything from construction to agriculture, manufacturing, education, um, professional services. The big spike is the financial sector. 
So, we asked before this survey, were you familiar with the term natural capital? Um, maybe just have a quick guess in your minds um, as to what you think that answer might have been. And we found that 61% of the audience answering the survey had not come across the term natural capital prior to taking the survey. So we provided a definition, and this was the definition that we provided. The short version is the Earth's stock of natural assets that supply us with essential goods and services on which all human life depends. And as you see, we've brought that to life a little with examples such as food, medicine, pollination, and, and so on. So based on that description, how important do you think Scotland's natural capital is? We asked to your organisation based on the definition provided. And this was equally interesting. So if we take the top three segments, uh, those who felt it was important, very important or essential, uh, that's actually two thirds of our audience. Which I think is significant given that they'd not engaged with the term before. Once it was explained, they understood the importance. Now, maybe just take a quick straw poll uh, in the audience here. We asked who is responsible for protecting and enhancing natural capital, and we allowed people to answer uh, multiple questions uh, or give multiple answers. Um, so if they felt that uh, it wasn't just the responsibility of the government or just the private sector or NGOs, they could uh, tick a number of boxes. So if you can just raise your hand, uh, do you think that the government uh, is responsible for enhancing and protecting Scotland's natural capital or natural capital in general? Um, Okay, so we have a, a large number there. Uh, what about the private sector? Okay, uh, probably yeah. equally large, difficult to say. Uh, okay, and uh, NGOs? I'd say, if anything, slightly smaller there. Uh, and citizens and communities? Another fairly large showing. And finally, collaborative initiatives between all of those. <laughs> that's, that's good. <laughs> um, okay, so this was, these were the answers that we got from, um, from our survey. So you can see on the left there uh, is government, uh, moving along the private sector, NGOs, citizens and communities, uh, we called it the population of Scotland and community groups. And finally, the most popular answer was collaborative initiatives involving any or all of those. Um, okay, which of the below are relevant to your organisation? What we did, this was an interesting one because we tried to base this around Scotland's Natural Capital Asset Index, which is uh, being developed by Scottish Natural Heritage. Uh, and we asked people to think which was relevant to their organisation. Uh, not surprisingly, this one on the right represents people who said, well, really not sure. We haven't previously had, a, uh, had cause to consider this question. Um, however, we're starting that process of, of getting people thinking. And when we rerun uh, the survey next year, hopefully uh, we'll get some slightly different answers. Um, which of the below sums up your organisation's attitude in relation to natural capital? Uh, well, we gave them a whole raft of opportunities. Now, you might think that businesses would only take action if regulation said they had to. And in fact, that was the largest answer, but you can see that there's a, a very broad spread there. So seeing business opportunities, um, showing leadership, uh, avoiding or reducing costs. Uh, it's not one dimensional by any means. How urgent do you feel it is um, to protect Scotland's natural capital? Uh, this gave another fairly resounding answer. 78% of business leaders in Scotland think it's urgent or very urgent um, to do this, which I think is a clear mandate. Um, finally, the last question we asked was, do you feel that a better understanding of our relationship with natural capital could contribute to better outcomes for business, society and the environment? Now, if you remember that at the very beginning, 61% of respondents weren't familiar with the term natural capital, we provided this explanation. Look what they said. 95% of those 508 people said that a better understanding of natural capital would contribute to better outcomes for their business, for society and the environment. So my personal perspective on this is really that we've talked about the what, there are still lots of questions, but 
there's plenty of traction around the what, the why, the who, the how, which Peter, I think, is going to be talking about in a minute. It, there's still lots of questions to be answered. But actually, I think that this will come down to the how well. How well we can really engage with all of the different audiences that must be part of the solution to these problems. How well we can communicate, how well we can collaborate, how well we can answer these ethical questions about nature, which is ultimately irreplaceable, but which is being destroyed under our current system. And we do need change. So ultimately, I think what happens next will depend on how well we can collaborate. Thank you.